Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here, or you've been sitting in the back row, but you are enjoying what you're hearing, please consider hitting the subscribe button and make sure your notification bell is set to all so you know every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee, or if you'd like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes, all of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Camping Horror Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh yeah, one more thing. For anyone that has a June birthday, the month of June only, please go over to the community tab and in the comment section of the post that I made, please post your birthdays. Any birthday postings in the comment section of a video will not be added to the list. Also. Within this narration, if you can slightly hear some banging, I'm truly sorry. The Habitats for Humanity house is right outside my studio window, which is still soundproof, but some of that noise still leaks in. So I'm going to shut up now and let's get to our stories. Okay, so every time I think about this story, my brain breaks. It was 2014. My girlfriend at the time and I went on an impromptu camping trip up to Northern California. I'm not quite exactly sure where, but we lived in Sacramento and drove about four or five hours up I-5. We were up in the hills and drove down some pretty sketchy roads. Once we found a spot, we parked our car and hiked about a half mile in, truly in the middle of nowhere. We set up our tent and made a small fire pit about 25 yards away. The day was fine. We hung out and did camping things, and when it was time for us to go to bed, we put out the fire, got in the tent, zipped it up, and went to sleep. This is where it gets really weird. The girl woke me up in the middle of the night to tell me she's going to go find a place to pee, but she was struggling getting out of the tent. I can't find the zipper, she says. It's gone. So I get up to help, and as I feel around, the walls are completely smooth. I grab the flashlight, and when I turned it on to investigate, we found out that the zipper was under us. All of our stuff was in order as we left it, but we were sleeping on the door. We roll the tent to get out, and when we finally do, we find that we are right next to the fire pit we built 25 yards away. We were so terrified and confused because there was no way we could have slept through both of us rolling a tent that far with all of our stuff staying in its place. We stayed up until the sun came back up and left right away. I still have zero explanation as to what happened. I entertained some pretty out there thoughts, but this one is one that will sit with me forever as the strangest thing that has ever happened in my life. Here's a little backstory and setup of the village I grew up in for context. The village I lived in was only at about 40 to 50 people at most. Everyone knew everyone. All 12 of us kids knew each other and played with each other. Naturally, some of us grouped together and explored the surrounding area since there wasn't much in the way of entertainment back then. This was the mid to late 90s in rural Ohio. The village was old. The village was old. The furthest back I could find about the village documentation-wise was that it was established back in the late 1790s as a small trading hub for the local area. 
Ohio didn't become a state until 1803. My village had a single church in the center of it, an old schoolhouse converted into an actual house just next to it, and pasture behind it with thick woods surrounding three of the four sides of the small town. Again, as said prior, my dad grew up around the area, so he was full of legends and stories about the area. One of those stories was about a small fort that was originally French, turned British, and finally colonial American in the area. Nobody really knew where exactly it was located, but there was a few mentions of a small fort in the area from the research I had done. One of these stories about this fort was that it was a primary trading route for the local native tribes and the influx of settlers that were arriving in the area. Naturally, conflicts arose as more and more people settled the surrounding area, and eventually, all-out conflict ensued between the settlers and the native tribes. The fort was said to be destroyed by fire. Both on people's sides slaughtered each other, and eventually the natives were driven away from the area with the help of a local militia. My dad always told me the land wasn't good, tainted in ways with bad energy. I guess when entire families are slaughtered and people being driven from their homeland, it can cause some long-term ill effects. When all of us kids were playing, we were always told two things. Number one, if the woods get quiet, you get quiet and leave immediately. Number two, if your name is being called out and you're way out into the woods, do not respond. Go home immediately and never look back. Pretend you never heard it to begin with. Everyone in the village knew how quirky the area was. Most days were the usual bland days, while some days it was like a fairy tale. Periodically other days it could be a nightmare. Now the people of the woods were probably the most common entity everyone in the village knew of, and were generally treated with respect and a wide berth. Some of the other things were generally best left well enough alone entirely. Here is my personal experience. In the late 90s, I was around 10 years old when I was overcome with an insatiable desire to go camping. It was mid-August, so hot and muggy during the day, but rather mild and cool at night. I gathered two of my friends and told them about it, and they both liked the idea. Now, generally, nobody really camped in our woods. My parents, along with many others, really didn't like the idea of a group of 10 and 11-year-olds going camping alone. My dad said we could, as long as he came with us just to ensure that we were safe. I reluctantly agreed. Prior to that night, I went out to scout out a good area to make camp at, and I knew of a fairly decent place that was close to the creek. Relatively flat and not too difficult to get to. I wanted to scout the area just to ensure it was cleared of debris and ready for tents. By the time I was well acquainted with the people of the woods, I made my offerings before entering the woods. I didn't see them while on my journey or anything, so I felt pretty good about that. Once I arrived to the location, I began moving things around, clearing out the sticks, large stones, and making a fire pit. Even going as far as stalking it with some wood and throwing some larger sticks nearby for fuel for later. I was so enthralled in what I was doing and so focused on getting the area cleared that by the time I was satisfied with what I had done, I just noticed how quiet everything around me became. When I say quiet, I mean dead silent. No birds, bugs, not even the wind, made a noise amongst the leaf litter. I immediately shut down everything I was doing. I stood there looking around, slowing my breathing, and just trying to listen for the faintest sound I could. I don't know how long I stood there motionless, 
a few minutes maybe, and then in the far distance I could hear a crow call, and almost immediately I began hearing the chirping of robins and even a faint whistling from the wind in the trees. The hair on my arms and neck were on end, and I figured, well, maybe it was just me making a ruckus, that everything nearby quieted down because of that. Content with that logical reasoning, I began making my way back home to pack up for the night. Around 6 p.m. that night, my two friends made their way over with backpacks, tents, and both me and my dad were finishing up dinner. All four of us made ready with everything we needed and began trekking out to the site I had prepared. Nothing all that noteworthy happened going to the site, even after setting up our tent, lighting the fire and making s'mores. It was shaping up to be a pretty fun night and rather enjoyable. Once we started to get ready to crawl into our tent for the night at around 10 or 11 p.m., the wind started to pick up and my dad said we might be in for some rain, but he didn't seem to have a look of contentment. My dad loved the rain, by the way, on his face when he said it. It was like he felt something was off, and it wasn't long that all of us started to feel that way. We all ended up crawling into our tents, anyways, since it was night, and possible rain incoming trekking back home would have sucked. We should have walked back. We situated our tents in a half circle around the fire pit, which all were facing the creek and the back of the tent facing the wood line. My dad was to the left of me in his military surplus tent, me in my cheapo Walmart single-person tent, just barely large enough for me, and my two friends to my right in their own tent. The wind howled for some time, half an hour to an hour before it calmed down. Then it got quiet. No crickets, no wind, no wildlife. The creek itself, which usually bubbles happily, also sounded muted. All we had was the faint glow of embers from the fire pit in front of our tents casting a warm glow. I could hear my heart throb in my ears, and I know my dad and two friends were just as anxious as I was, as I could hear them shift uncomfortably. I heard one of my friends tent zipper, and naturally, I undid my zipper too to see what was going on. As soon as I popped my head out to look, I saw my dad come out of his tent with the machete he had, and he faced the wood line. My friend had his head poking out too, and asked if I heard that noise. I didn't hear anything. My heart was pounding so hard, it was hard hearing him even whisper. We both partially get out of our tent to see what my dad was looking at, but all we could see was inky darkness. And then I heard it. A distant and faint, hello? It was coming from some ways away in the darkness of the woods. I could see my dad shift uncomfortably on his feet, white knuckling his machete, looking into the wood line. Then again the voice called out, hello? It didn't seem right, off-putting almost as if whoever was speaking was trying to speak in a very feminine voice, faint and fragile. My dad motioned me to grab some of the extra wood next to his tent and throw it on the fire, which I reluctantly did. Leaving the perceived safety of my tent didn't sit well with me as the fire began to slowly grow in brightness. My dad stepped backwards near the fire and stood there facing the wood line. By this time, my other friend popped his head out of his tent too, and all three of us, including my dad, were watching the wood line, unsure what to expect. Nothing came out, and we didn't hear the voice again. An hour passed, and by this time, my dad was sitting on a large stone next to his tent, one leg crossed and a machete in his right hand, watching silently only the sound of crackling fire echoing against the shell cliff face across the creek. Several hours passed and both of my friends went back into their tents. Only me and my dad was out, 
me mending the fire and my dad watching and waiting. I could hear rustling to our right just beyond the light from the fire in the tree line. My friend closest to it popped his head out, looked at me and asked me, What? As if he was wanting me to repeat what I said. I didn't say a word. Hadn't said a word since I came out of my tent for the first time. I put my finger up to my lips and motioned him to be quiet. By the time I did so, my dad was standing next to me and told us both to shush, and immediately we heard someone say, Come here, in the same off-putting feminine voice as earlier. All three of us just stood there peering in the direction of where the voice came from, and shortly after, we heard what sounded like something move back deeper into the woods. It didn't sound heavy, it sounded light, like something lightly trotting back into the woods. That was the last time we heard it. Shortly after, I'm assuming early morning, just before daybreak, the wood life returned. Crickets, the distant chirp of birds, and the whisper from the wind through the leaves. Once daybreak came, we all broke down our tents, packed up, and began hiking back home. We were paranoid the entire way back, stopping, listening, and looking. We didn't see or hear anything or anyone. Nobody said a word on the way back. Once we made it to my backyard, my dad broke the silence and told us what we experienced never happened and it would do us good not to say a word to anyone about it. He had fear written all over his face, if not even he had experienced something like that. To this day, I don't know what it was or who it was. I did end up asking my aunt next door later in life if she experienced something similar since she grew up in the area too. But even she was tight-lipped about it, saying, we shouldn't have gone camping out there, and my dad was a fool for letting us go. I have since left my village and moved out of state, and I have ran into similar stories down here in the southeast, with the same reluctance to explain what it was or could be. So, if anyone could enlighten me, I'm all ears. I am from Finland, and that's also where these things I'm about to describe to you happened. This was some years ago, pre-smartphone or GPS era. It was the end of the summer, and myself and two friends were on a camping trip way up in the north in Lapland. The mosquito season was over, and the weather was cooling down in anticipation of the coming fall. The three of us had packed food and gear for a 10-day trek. The car we arrived in had been left at the parking lot of a visitor center. This happened within the premises of the Yurho Kokonen National Park a 985-square-mile stretch of wilderness near the Russian border. The terrain that varies greatly, from treeless and semi-mountainous to dense forest of spruce and pine and dwarf birch. There are lots of swamps. Seeing reindeer is not uncommon, and some nights you might hear wolves in the distance. You can run into a bear or a wolverine in this place, but of course, Normally, they avoid people. We mostly camped in a tent, but some nights we used shelters and simple huts provided to travelers free of charge. The trip had lasted five days. We were at the furthest of any kind of civilization we were going to be on that particular outing, truly in the middle of nowhere. There really is nothing there. There are no villages, towns, or industry. The place is a national park, after all. Seeing other hikers happen from time to time. You'd see some people in the distance, maybe. Very rarely would you come face to face with anyone. So, in the middle of our trip, we were camped in a small clearing, woodland extending around us for a considerable distance in all directions. It was already dark. We had eaten our evening meal, and all three of us were jammed into our only tent. 
It was a bit cramped, but we fit. We took turns carrying it during the hikes. We were just exchanging some jokes and crude humor in the dark, like guys in their 20s do, about to go to sleep in our sleeping bags. When we quieted down, we began to hear it. Talking. And the sound of machinery. Given our location, this was profoundly weird. We camped in a tent because there were no huts nearby. Maybe there was another camp somewhere near us? We couldn't quite make out what was being said, but it was a human voice. No doubt about it. But nothing really could explain the sound of the heavy machinery. It sounded like an excavator or a tank. Something big, powerful, and really not too far away. Combined with the sound of talking, we thought construction yard. But at that time of night, in an unpopulated, protected nature reserve, we got out of our tent. It was cold and pitch black. The campfire had some coals still glowing. We took out our flashlights. My two buddies have always been a lot braver than me. The sound was clearly coming from the north, maybe half a kilometer away. We thought the construction might be going on behind a small hill some distance away. We could see no lights or anything. We still could not make out what was being said. The speaking-like voice was monotonous, and it was impossible even to say what language was being used. Still sounded a lot like a person speaking, though. We may be aware of the sort of spooky phenomenon of hearing a human voice, but in static? Maybe you're used to a blow dryer or been sure someone is taking, turn it off, and it was just something the brain tried to interpret from the steady hum. Maybe it was sort of like that. It's hard to explain. The machinery-like sound continued. Not loud, but you could sort of make out the powerful engine, at times accelerating or adding power, at times at idle. My two friends resolved to go find out what was going on. We put our warm clothes back on, donned boots, and I sat next to the dying fire, adding some more wood to it. I would stay at camp while my buddies left to go check out this mystery construction yard in the middle of nowhere in the Lapland woods. So, there I sat. The guys took out their maps, took a compass heading and left and I could hear them make their way through the forest, see the light from their flashlights. Then they were gone. The weird sounds continued, unaltered. They were gone like 15 minutes, then maybe 30. Then the better part of an hour. It was odd, judging by the volume of the firewood, and trying to make out what the person talking was saying, but it was too tiny and obscure. The guys had been away for over two hours. I figured they had stayed for coffee with the construction guys or something. Then the sound stopped. Just like that. It just ended. All at the same time. The engine sound and the voice both just quit. It was very silent. I waited for another 30 minutes. Very worried now that something had happened, that maybe my friends were lost. Should I go and try to find them? I shouted their names several times and built the fire pretty big. I was scared shitless when suddenly I saw the flashlights of my friends. Apparently, they were returning in a hurry. The guys got back to camp, out of breath. They told me the following. They had followed the sound beyond the small ridge in the distance, there was nothing there, and it seemed like they were not getting any closer to the source of the sound. They had to stop every now and then, be quiet and listen to it to be able to walk towards it. They walked and stopped like this for some time, then realized they were not getting any closer. The sounds did not change in volume at all. They decided to go just a bit further several times when suddenly the sound just stopped, like someone pressed a button on a recording. They realized they had been going on for a long time, 
They were in the middle of the dark woods, alone. They reversed the heading and started back at a brisk pace. Eventually, they saw my big-ass fire from the top of a hill and found their way back. The weird thing is, we seemed to think the sound stopped at different times. They had been gone two and a half hours in total. They said the sounds stopped at around the hour and 15 minutes mark after they left. Then they started to head back immediately, return trip taking a bit longer, even though they were at a good pace. They apparently wandered around a bit. For me, the sound stopped at the two hour mark, just 30 minutes before they returned. We did not sleep that night. Nothing more happened on the trip, and we never found out what the weird construction yard-like sound was about. When we returned to the park's visitor center some five days later, we asked around, but no one knew of any ongoing construction taking place in the whole National Park area. It's been bugging us ever since. Hold on to your seats because this one is a long one. So, here goes. My husband and I went camping for the first time ever in Arizona as part of our long trip out west. I had picked out this really cool place that was on a mountain overlooking a beautiful landscape. It's next to a cliff and in a really isolated location. I'm talking like 20 miles out on gravel road in the middle of a national forest. So we get there and set up our tent and hike a little bit and take pictures of the surrounding area. We see a few cars parked around two tents and decided to stop and talk to the other campers nearby because we had heard that there was going to be a bad storm that night. These were four guys who were from Arizona and they told us not to worry and that the storm didn't get that terrible around this area. That was all the persuading that we needed to stay. Later on, while walking a bit further down from the campsite, we see a woman there with her dog and an older lady. We smile and wave and continue to hike down a bit further into the forest. Let me elaborate that. Because of the storm, we are one among maybe a total of seven campers that decided to stay and withstand the night. We watch the sunset when we get back to our site, make sure our car was only a few yards away, and go into our tent when it gets too dark to see. There are no stars tonight due to the storm clouds, and it hasn't begun to rain yet. So we decided to try to sleep right away so that we would possibly sleep through the storm when it does hit. It is an insanely windy night, so it's hard to sleep, but eventually we get a bit of shut-eye. I wake up at around 10.30 p.m. to the sound of some crazy thunder rolling through the mountains and rain hitting down on our tent. I'm a little freaked out because they get a lot of flash floods out here and I didn't want to fall off the side of the cliff. But I tell myself to try to sleep and eventually I dozed off again. It's midnight and I am awake again. This time because I hear something very heavy hitting the side of our tent. Like full on sounded like someone could have been punching our tent and sliding something down the side of it. I open my eyes and I can't see anything. It's completely dark, no light whatsoever. The sound continues every couple of minutes and at this point I'm shitting bricks. Suddenly I hear footsteps right next to my side of the tent. They are slow but steady. I feel my entire body freeze up. I seriously start thinking about how this is it, and I'm going to die. My heart is beating so fast that I am certain whatever is out there can hear it. Then, whatever it is lets out a deep sigh right on the opposite side of the tent. I'm thinking it's a bear, and realizing that, I might actually have to face this thing, so it's a desperate call for my husband's mind-reading powers. I squeeze his hand really hard, repeatedly, and he wakes up. 
But instead of reading my mind, he blurts out, What's wrong? Why are you squeezing my hand? Right as he says this, the footsteps stop. I don't hear the footsteps again. So, after a while, I break out of my frozen state and tell him what I had heard. We decided it may have been an animal passing by, but whatever is hitting our tent continues every so often, and I'm starting to go a little insane from this night, wondering what is going on. We convince ourselves that it's just pines falling from a tree above us and try to sleep again. We just need to make it through the night, then we can laugh about it all in the morning. A couple of minutes go by and suddenly the tent caves in on my husband's side, right on his head. He whispers that it feels like something is pushing the tent down. I feel my heart instantly sink. I'm freaking out thinking it's a bear that just set on his head. But he decides to push back and we hear the familiar noise of something sliding off of our tent that we've been hearing for the past few hours. We then realize that it's been snowing outside and that the noise we heard hitting our tent was heavy ice falling from the tree above our tent. Our tent is covered in thick ice, and my husband pushes the tent from the inside until all of the ice slides off. Still determined to make it through the night and a little relieved that it was just ice and not a bear, we try to sleep and make it to sunrise. We keep on a small light that my husband, luckily, brought with him just to calm us down a little bit. Things are starting to seem normal again. We both close our eyes. It's 3 a.m. at this point, not even 30 minutes after we are settling down. My literal worst nightmare happens. Out of the pitch black night, we hear a woman screaming. We distinctly hear her say, What the fuck? Oh my God, what the fuck? Followed by some other non-tangible words that sound something like, Help! The way that she screams doesn't sound like anger. It sounds like pure terror and a sense of panic. My husband and I both frozen looking at each other. I quickly shut off our light and start panicking and asking what we should do because what the hell? How is this really happening right now? While we are trying to decide what to do for the next few minutes, we hear her again, but this time she is screaming, no, 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 no as we hear a car speed off until the night. I'm in tears at this point. We have no idea what is happening. It's dead silent now, save for the icy rain hitting our tent. It definitely sounded like she was not in the car, but more like she was desperately yelling after it or begging not to be hurt. And this, this was my breaking point because I could take the bad weather I could take the possible bear outside my tent. I could even take the ice falling on our heads in one of the warmest states in America. But one thing I cannot and will never be able to handle is a screaming person in the middle of the pitch black woods at 3 a.m. We decided to get the hell out of there and even contemplate leaving our tent and booking it to our car. But instead, we try to stay level-headed and grab our valuables and put them in the car first. We frantically gather our things and stay close as we shuffle to our car. I close the door and keep the lights off for a while, scared to attract any unwelcome visitors. And while my husband goes back to grab the tent, I start the car and call 911. I tell them what I had heard and where we were, and they say that they are sending someone to the campsite just to make sure everything is okay. Only thing is, we are literally in the middle of nowhere, and it will definitely take them more than an hour to arrive. Not to mention, the storm left those gravel roads into some pretty terrible conditions. So, my husband and I decide to start driving, and it's like 3.30 a.m. now. As we drive out of the campsite, my husband notices one last eerie detail that stuck with me. The four guys that we had talked to earlier had already left. All three of their cars were gone 
while their tents remained. Whatever scared them off, they surely left in a hurry. It was only after we started driving that the thought occurred to me. Whatever was walking next to my tent may not have been an animal. It very well could have been someone lurking around in the dark who decided to go after the girl we had seen previously on our hike. I'm not quite sure what went down on that lone mountain that night, and I hope that everyone got out okay. So, whatever was at our campsite that night terrorizing us all, let's never meet again. Ah, a quick update. I called the police department back to follow up and was told that the cops searched the area for a few hours and talked with a few people who were still there, but did not find anything. I have always been uncomfortable with the story that I'm about to tell you, partly because it was so odd and out of the ordinary, but nevertheless, in the spirit of October and the fact that I am starting to go camping again, I thought it would be interesting to share my own scary camping experience. This happened during the summer of 2012, when I was about 15, and still an active member of a local Boy Scout troop. I went camping, something my troop had frequently done. The camp we chose was for a full weekend. It was a nice forested area with taller grass. It also lacked other campers, and we saw no cars driving in or out throughout the time we spent there. Since we did not have to worry about other campers, our troop had a big campfire on Saturday night that went late into the night. Eventually, our campfire started to die out, prompting us to put it out and head to our respective tents and hit the hay. Oddly for me, I was unable to sleep that night. I usually slept well on campout, especially when I have the pleasure of using a tent alone, like I had done on this occasion. So I sat there in complete silence, listening to the various sounds around my tent. Eventually, I found myself dozing off until I heard something walking nearby our campsite. There was a very apparent rustling of grass that began to get closer and closer to the blob tents that our boys were sleeping in. After a solid minute of movement, the sound stopped right in front of a tent. That was about seven or so feet from mine. I then heard the rustling start up again and head off in the direction of the forest. I was paralyzed with fear. What could have made that sound? I thought about it for a solid few minutes and eventually decided it must have been an adult checking on us. Before I went to sleep, I looked out at the little tent's mesh window on the side of my tent and did not see anything out of the ordinary in our campsite. This sound went on for a bit in the distance, but I did not record for how long as I eventually fell asleep. I woke up later that night to the same sound of rustling. Yet this time, it was close to our tent circle, as it was the first time I had heard it. While I did not think too much of this, I silently listened to the sound to see where it was headed. It once again went to the same area it did the first time. Being curious, I peered through the tent window to see what was making the noise. My face turned white, and I could not move. My mind was still trying to register what was going on. I saw a large black figure standing before the tent in the darkness, and it was clear it was not a scout, as the figure had no flashlight on and was far too large to be any boy in our troop. Suddenly, the figure inched their hand to the tent door and began to slowly unzip it. After what felt like minutes, the figure seemed to poke their head into the tent. Immediately after, a deafening screech came from the tent. I heard other tents being unzipped and saw lights being flashed at the one tent, as well as a black figure starting to run away from the tent. Within seconds, the figure was running out of the view into the line of trees. A few adults at the adult camp came to see the commotion, 
The boys who were in the tent told what they had experienced, and several boys mentioned that they heard the sound of rustling in the grass around our tents throughout the night. Unfortunately, none of the boys were able to get a clear view of the person, except that the figure looked like a man and he wore dark clothing. Disturbed, the adults had us be moved to the campsite where they were staying at, and two adults volunteered to stay awake for the rest of the night in case the creeps returned. The next morning, we quickly packed up our stuff and left as fast as possible. We warned the ranger in charge, who called the local sheriff. From what I know, the person was never caught, and our troop never camped there again. It was easily one of the most frightening experiences and something I would always remember when I went camping during my time as a Boy Scout. The creepy man stalking my Boy Scout troop I hope we never see you again. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote, pretty deep in the park way up on one of the mountains, not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which I think was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of this little road but our campsite. We parked at the entrance to the park and spent the day hiking up to the site, setting up camp and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and turned in. Not long afterwards, we discovered that one of the guys with a snored, and I do mean loudly, like walls of the tent shaking kind of snoring. Truly deafening stuff. After probably half an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tent, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station, and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road, where the reception was better and where we could actually be able to hear the radio over all that snoring. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck with its lights off, appeared out of the woods and passed us, very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and even briefly called in just to say hello. Finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things, while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her, and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves towards the tent, coming from my right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it, just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off, and then shuts off its engine, and sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one of theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns or bear spray, so we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night, and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sounds as the engine cools off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear by her breathing that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. 
It feels like a really fucking long time went by. It had to be at least 10 minutes, but could have been half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck started up again and then backed up down the long, narrow dirt road. It never turned on its headlights. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now, we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy shit. Fuck. But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning as we planned. And yes, we checked with the park, and they did not own any black unmarked SUVs, nor did any ranger come to check on our site in the middle of the night. I have finally found the inspiration and courage to tell a story that has haunted my brother and me for a few years now. In the spirit of Halloween, it seems like a perfect day to tell a very real tale. In 2007, I was a freshman going on sophomore in college, and my brother, Martin, was still in high school. We have too much younger siblings, so at the time, they were around elementary school age. My parents decided to take a cruise for their 20th wedding anniversary that year. So my brother and I were voluntold to watch my younger brother and sister, Cole and Charlotte. My brother's best friend, Christian, stayed with us while my parents were gone, and he helped us plan fun activities with the younger siblings. One idea they were particularly excited about was a camping trip, as my family had never been particularly outdoorsy in the past. Their eyes lit up at the prospect of cooking our dinner over a campfire and fishing in the stream. Since it was early summertime, we had the great luck of warm but not too hot weather and a beautiful clear sky for stargazing. Finally packed and ready for a somewhat long drive to the mountains, we checked into our campsite before dark and Cole and Charlotte helped us set up the tent. It was strange, but there were no other people at the campground, which was unusual for this time of year. Once we finished dinner, the younger brother and sister were ready for sleep. So Martin, Christian, and I stayed awake a little longer, catching up and getting things ready for the next morning. Suddenly, a white Astro van pulled up in the camping spot directly next to ours. He had dozens to choose from, but chose to park right next to us. Oh well, Christian said. At least we have company now. He called out a quick, hello, to the new neighbor with no response back. I got an uneasy feeling almost immediately, but decided to push it aside and continued to get the fishing poles ready for in the morning and put the food away for the night to ward off bears and wild animals. Over the next hour or so, things started to get really weird. The man parked next to us, got out of his van to sit at the picnic table with only a small fire. From our roaring fire, I could see that he was looking directly at us. However, his fire died out completely several minutes later, and he continued just sitting there. I could feel him staring, and I couldn't see his face anymore. He was just sitting there, breathing. Christian and Martin noticed that I was uneasy, and they picked up on how creepy the situation started to become. Martin whispered, Why is he breathing like that? I don't feel safe anymore. I told Christian and Martin that I was going to stay awake because I didn't trust this guy. As soon as they moved from the fire into their tent, the man rose from the picnic table and started moving towards us. I called out, Hello? With no response from him. Finally, in a whim of panic, I demanded that we pack up and get the fuck home immediately. 
Christian and Martin got out their tent and saw the figure of a man just standing there, staring at us, breathing really hard. We tried to stay as quiet and calm as possible while we packed up to not alarm Cole and Charlotte. Finally, throwing everything in the trunk, we drove away, not looking back. Before leaving the site itself, I asked if we could go to the check-in area at the lodge to see what the hell was going on and see if they knew anything more. What was this guy's deal? But, to my surprise, there was no one else registered at the campsite that evening. The story doesn't end there, though. About six months later, I was in my sophomore year of school when a local hiker went missing in a county over from where we camped and where I went to college. She was doing something so normal, hiking with her dog. Sadly, she turned up several months later, murdered and found in a white Ashto van. When the news finally released photos of the van and the man's face, I just knew it was them. I got a phone call from both my brother and his friend, and they recognized him too. We came to find out that it wasn't his first murder several years later, and he became known as the National Forest Serial Killer. I sincerely mean it when I say that I am an incredibly cautious camper now because of this encounter. Thinking that it could have just been us or my younger siblings still gives me nightmares to this day. We recently had a reunion, Christian, Martin, and I, and we talked about what had happened to us with more than 10 years gone by. It's amazing. We all remember the details as they are etched into our memories forever. So, creepy, heavy breathing, would-be serial killer camper neighbor... Let's never meet, ever. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true camping horror stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for continuing to support Back to Ashes. Without you, there wouldn't be a me, and there also wouldn't be Back to Ashes. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all. <laughs>